Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. My name is Ryan. And I'm Rosie. How are you doing tonight, Rosie? I'm doing well. I'm sitting in the rocking chair that I recently built from Amazon, and I'm drinking out of my new water bottle, so I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I like your new water bottle. It's very burrito-proof. Yes, because I have problems with a certain cat dipping his dirty little mitts in my cups. (laughs) Yeah, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Every night, we get in bed, Brio shows up, and he tries to drink out of Rosie's water. Every time. I mean, I'm sure some people are cool with that, but... I'm not about that life. Yeah. I'm not about having the same germs. I can't stop thinking about where that tongue's been, you know what I'm saying? I've seen where it's been, and it's not a good... Not good. Anyway, we should save cat news for the end. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the story, we're going to share a five-star review from one of our favorite listeners. I know, he is. <laughs> okay, it's entitled, True Stories Are the Best. Simon here. Thanks for the lovely comments about me last week. Listen to the sad story of Dana. Then, when Ryan talked about his story, I went back. You always put eating disorders relating to females. You was really brave to open up, and I'm sure... That honesty like yours could really help if people got your message. Keep up the great podcast from Simon. Well, thank you, Simon. I know, I really like that. That was so sweet. I hope your crosswords are going well. I do, I do too. This episode of Voice of the Victim podcast is sponsored by Podcorn. And Rosie and I are really passionate about the things we talk about on the show, but it does take a lot of time and energy to put these outlines together and just to record the show. Sponsors help us be able to work less at our other jobs and spend more time making the show the best it can be. But we really have no idea what we're doing when it comes to finding sponsors. But thankfully, the awesome people over at Podcorn have been able to help us out with that. Podcorn is a really simple and easy to use platform. It's a marketplace that connects podcasters directly to amazing sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, reviews, topical discussions, and more. And I love how easily we can just click on more details and learn about a business and see whether it would be a good fit for us and then send them a proposal for a specific date. So it makes it really easy to get familiar with the things we might be talking about. There's no middleman, so podcasters can choose what their specific rate is, while also making better quality ads, because we can directly collaborate with the sponsors. And I like it when ad breaks don't change the tone of the episode or the show, and so I love host red ads and being able to get in touch with the brands themselves so we can really wrap our minds around what we're talking about. You don't need to give up creative control or rights to your podcast to use Podcorn. And the people that work there are always willing to help and work with you to make the process painless. Seriously, they're super laid back and they really let creators do what they feel is best for their audience. And they also make sure you get paid. (laughs) And that's important, right? Mm -hmm. The Marketplace mission of Podcorn is to give podcasters transparency, creative freedom, and full control of how and when they monetize their hard work. And we know podcasters work hard. So if you're a podcaster of any size... Click the link in our show notes to sign up to Podcorn and start browsing opportunities to find your own sponsors. All right. Tonight's story is a really insane case. Uh, It's really heartbreaking. And what's interesting about it is the entire investigation pretty much was captured on camera. So with that said, let's start by getting to know the two main people involved a little bit. Shanann Catherine Rusick was born on January 10th, 1984, to Frank and Sandra Rusick in Aberdeen, North Carolina. So, at the time of this story, 
In 2018, she was 34 years old. Shanann suffered from diabetes, which led to a tragic car accident after she'd gone into a diabetic shock. Which had to be really traumatizing for her and her family. Yeah, that would, I mean, there's nothing you can do when you have that kind of thing happen. Yeah, and can you imagine, like, feeling like you can't trust your body anymore? Yeah. When something like that happens? In 2010, Shanann said that she'd been in a really bad place in her life when she got a friend request on Facebook from a man in Spring Lake, North Carolina. His name was Christopher Lee Watts. And just to put in perspective, Spring Lake is about 31 to 40 miles away from Aberdeen, depending on the route you take. Chris was a little over a year younger than her, born on May 16, 1985, making him 32 at the time of the story. She wasn't sure about accepting the friend request from a stranger, but she figured she was never going to actually meet him, so she accepted it. Of course, one thing led to another, as it does. And two years later, on November 3rd, 2012, Shanann and Chris were married. And just over a year after that, Shanann gave birth to their first baby girl on December 17th, 2013. So that escalated quickly. Um, yeah. They named the baby girl Bella Marie. And less than two years after that, they had another baby girl on July 17th, 2015. They named her Celeste Catherine, but her nickname was Cece. Aw, I wonder if they're Office fans. (laughs) You know, I don't know if that's what that means. (laughs) Okay, well, I'm going to just believe they were. (laughs) Okay. So at some point... um, They had moved away from North Carolina, across the country, out to Colorado. And they settled there in a five-bedroom home in the small town of Frederick. So Frederick, it was a relatively moderate-sized town. Uh, In the 2010 census, there were just under 8,700 people. So it's, I don't know, I'd say it's a small town. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they fell on some rough times financially. In 2015 the couple had accumulated too much debt to handle and ended up declaring bankruptcy. This seemed to be a fresh start for them. Chris was working at a company called Anadarko Petroleum, and Shanann was an independent rep for a multi-level marketing company called Livelle, where she sold a product called Thrive. Yeah. So according to the website, the Thrive Experience is a premium lifestyle system to help you experience peak physical and mental levels. I actually did something similar to this when I was like 20 years mm-hmm. old. Remember that? Yes, I do. I tried selling Herbalife back when I was I was kind of a health nut for a while. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Whatever happened to that? <laughs> Me. Because we all go through those phases. <laughs> That's right. It was before we were married. It was. But... It didn't go so well for me, but it can be really lucrative for people that are good at sales, which I never made one. You didn't even make one? No. That's sad. I'm not a good salesperson. No, I don't know how to talk to people. I'm aware. But Shanann, on the other hand, was actually very good at it. Yeah. Shanann's work selling Thrive began to take off, and she posted videos to Facebook about it regularly. And you can actually still find those videos on her Facebook. It's open to the public, but it really seemed like things were going well for her in her business and in her marriage. She was winning trips and rewards from Level or Level or however you say that, um, just because she was so successful at her work. And she also made a video talking about how she met Chris on Facebook mm-hmm. and how he was the best thing that ever happened to her. So, you know, she was really in love with him. And I love how, even though she'd been in that really dark place in 2010 and she had that car accident and the bankruptcy in 2015, she was definitely knocked down, but she didn't stay down. She got back up, started taking care of herself, and no pun intended, but she really started to thrive. And that's something I always try to live by, you know? It doesn't matter how often or how hard life knocks you down. It's that you get back up again and you don't give up. Because once you give up, you lose. This is the greatest (laughs) lesson I learned from Rocky. (laughs) Mom will be happy to hear that reference. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Remember when she she had us watch it? I do remember. All six of them? All I remember was holding your hand. I enjoyed it. 
I didn't get much out of the movie, but <laughs> but I think Shanann's life really embodied that, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, she'd gone through so much, but she kept getting back up and doing the best she could. Shanann became friends with Nicole Atkinson, who was her business partner and close friend at the time of the story that we're discussing tonight. Nicole had worked at a hair salon and would sometimes cut Shanann's hair for her. And at some point, Shanann had told Nicole about Thrive and had given her a sample of pack. Nicole was also very good at it. And by June of 2018, she was able to quit her job at the hair salon where she had worked for 14 years. Oh, that's awesome. Great job, Nicole. So both Shanann and Nicole were doing Thrive full time. And there's actually a video on Shanann's Facebook where she's celebrating Nicole's success with a live video where she announces that Nicole had hit a new milestone where she had gotten the car bonus. Whoa, Apparently, a car bonus? Yeah, apparently the company was awarding her with a luxury car of her choice. And I mean serious luxury cars between Cadillac, BMW, Tesla, Mercedes, Audi, and Lexus. Whoa. So that gives you an idea of the kind of success that both her and Shanann were having with this company. Hmm, like, that's an- they were really thriving. What would you pick? Man, that is a tough question. Tesla? Probably an Audi or a Lexus. Mm, interesting. So that gives you an idea of the kind of success they were both having with this and just how far Shanann had pulled herself up out of the darkness. It really shows you something about her character. Shanann and Nicole had become very close. Shanann referred to them as sisters from another mother. On Monday morning, June 11th, 2018, Shanann surprised Chris at home, wearing a shirt that said, Oops, we did it again, as a cute little way to tell him some big news. Mm Mm-hmm. They were pregnant again. She recorded his reaction and posted it to Facebook. Not sure if that's a great idea. (laughs) Could have turned out different. (laughs) It's funny, because in the video, he looked at the test that she was holding, and it was pink, I guess, and he's like, Does pink mean it's going to be a girl? (laughs) (laughs) Like, it's kind of goofy. It's cute. Yeah. So, to their friend group, they actually came across as a nearly perfect couple. Nicole said that Chris, she knew him to be a very loving father. Shanann's mom said that he was so in love with her, he'd do anything to make her happy. And their friend Christina saw them as an inspirational couple, you know, hashtag mm-hmm. couple goals <laughs> mm-hmm. type of thing. So definitely everything looked perfect on the outside. But Chris and Shanann were having some underlying issues in their marriage that were definitely putting a strain on their relationship. In mid to late June of 2018, Shanann took the girls and went to visit her parents in North Carolina. They stayed there for about six weeks. That's a long time to be apart from your mate. This is a super long time. While she was there, she started telling her mother that she had noticed a change in Chris in the past couple of weeks since she told him that she was pregnant. Sometime after Shanann got home from North Carolina, she had texted her friend Addie and told her that Chris had changed and he didn't want another baby. Oof. So that's a pretty big deal, and that would be putting a lot of strain on the relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's telling her this a little too late. On the weekend of August 10th through 12th, 2018, she went on a business trip for a training event in Scottsdale, Arizona with Nicole. Shanann was 15 weeks pregnant at this point, and she wasn't feeling well for most of the trip. Because of the strain in her marriage, she was worried about their future being newly pregnant. She wasn't eating or drinking much, and it was concerning to Nicole. And I can't imagine the stress that Shanann was under on this weekend, Mm -hmm. worrying that she would have had to care for three kids on her own and really had an unclear picture of the future. You know, that's actually, I, I don't know how accurate this is and don't jump on me if you're a psychologist or whatever, and you're a lot smarter than me, but I've heard that one of the keystones of depression is not being able to imagine the future or like having a blurry image of what the future will be. Hmm is like almost the definition of depression. Really? Yeah. Interesting. But I can't remember where I heard that, so <laughs> okay. don't quote me on the it. back of a cereal box? I don't know. I'm just kidding. They got home late Sunday night, and Nicole dropped Shanann off 
at her home early Monday morning at 1.48 a.m. That is early. Yeah, on the plane, Shannon was having a really rough time being pregnant. She was really uncomfortable and, you know, everything else on her mind. But the next day, something very strange happened. They had a business meeting scheduled that morning, but Shanann never showed up. Which I guess makes sense if she was feeling awful all weekend and got home at 2 a.m., mm-hmm. you know. Nicole texted and called her multiple times, but she never responded. Then she called their mutual friend, Christina, who typically received a morning text from Shanann. She hadn't heard from Shanann either, and that's when it clicked with both of them that something was off. Yeah, so at this point... Nicole really began to worry, and just after noon at 12.10 p.m., she drove over to the Watts family home to check on her friend. But when she got there, she noticed that most of the blinds were still shut. So she rang the doorbell and knocked, but nobody answered. Nicole knew the key code, so she tried to open the door. But the inside chain was latched, holding the door shut. Nicole called Christina again, worried, Then Christina suggested that maybe she was at her OBGYN appointment. So she drove down to the doctor's office and asked about her, hoping that it would clear everything up. But again, she was disappointed to learn that she hadn't been there at all that day. She rushed back to the house. Nicole tried to call Chris, and he told her that Shanann had taken the girls on a playdate that morning. But this was odd, because Shanann's car was still in the garage. Her shoes that she wore every day were still in the front of the house, and all the blinds were still closed. He also minimized his concerns by telling her that they were planning on separating soon. Which she had no idea that like, that it had come to that. Like She knew they were having issues, but this was kind of startling to her. And it also explains now to Nicole, who didn't know this, why Shanann was so stressed out on that trip. Mm-hmm. But... You know, she noticed all these little details that only a best friend would know, like the shoes she wore every day were still at the front door. And she knew Shanann liked the sunlight, but all the blinds were still closed. You know, she knew something was off. Nicole asked Chris to come home because she felt like something was wrong. And after all, it was still his two daughters and pregnant wife. So he told her he'd be there in a half hour. So keep that in mind. He said a half hour. This was, you know, around 12.30 probably. The 30 minutes came and went and he never showed up. Again, she called him and told him she didn't want to cause any more issues for them, but she really felt he needed to be there because she felt like something was really wrong. He told her he was on the road, but he was still about 45 minutes out. So first he said he was a half hour away, then she called him half hour later. And now he's 45 minutes away. So that's interesting. Now this is when Nicole decided to call the police. So we're going to go ahead and play the 911 call just to give some context and fill in the details of what happened. Paul County Communications, this is Stacey. Hi, Stacey. My name is Nicole, and I'm calling because I'm concerned about um, a friend of mine. Um I dropped her off at her house at 2 in the morning last night because we were out of town together and we were on the way back from the airport and she's pregnant. And I haven't been able to get a hold of her this morning and I've gone to her house and her car's there and stuff like that, but she won't answer the door. She won't answer phone calls. She won't answer text messages. And I'm just really, really concerned. And she had a doctor's appointment this morning and she didn't go to it. And I'm just, I don't know what to do. I've called him and talked to him and he said that, she went on a play date with her other two daughters, but like if she went on a play date, they're both in car seats. Why would she not take her car? <laughs> Perfectly understandable. And then I said, like, Chris, can you just come home and check to make sure she's okay? Because the shoes she wears every single day are right inside her door. And he was like, yeah, I'll be there in three minutes. Well, that was 45 minutes ago. And I called him and asked him again, can you please come home? And he's like, I'm 45 minutes out. So um, we were out of town for work. And we flew in last night. Our flight got delayed, and I dropped her off at her house at 2 in the morning. She's 15 weeks pregnant, and she wasn't feeling well over the weekend, and she was very, like, distraught and out of the sorts because her and her husband are having issues. So it was concerned because she wasn't, like, eating or drinking and stuff like that. So then this morning, I was like, let me know if you need me to take you to your doctor's appointment because you're not feeling well. 
And I have called and texted. I've come to her house. She's not answering the door. She's not responding to text messages, phone calls. I've had other friends reach out to her. None of us can get her to respond to us. Um, they have two little girls that are um, three and four. I mean, there's no movement in the house whatsoever. And he states that she didn't take them to daycare and was going to go on a play date. But they're both in car seats and their car, her car is here. What's her name? Shanann Watts. It's S-H-A-N-A-N-N Watts, W-A-T-T-S. When was the last time that you heard from her? When I dropped her off at her house, I okay. watched her and made sure she got in the house. Okay. That was at 2 a.m. It was actually 1.55. I literally live like 5, 10 minutes from her. And her vehicle is, is it parked in the garage? Yes. And I probably, because I was concerned, I, I know I don't want to get a doctor's office in trouble, but I went to the doctor's office because I been used in as doctors, and I said, I know you can't give me things because of HIPAA, but can you just tell me if she showed up at her appointment this morning? And the lady was like, no, she did not. Okay. Is that that's unusual behavior behavior for her to not show up to her doctor's appointment? No. Okay. No, no. She, I mean, pregnancy, like, she was so excited and then got blindsided from her husband that he wanted to separate a okay. week ago. And her husband's name is Chris? Yes, his name is Chris Watts. And he told you that um, she went on a play date today with the girls. Okay. Um, yeah, but she told me last night when we were driving home, she's like, the morning's going to suck because I have to take the girls to daycare tomorrow. And I made the statement, well, you could keep them home with you. And she's like, no, that'd be more exhausting. <laughs> she's like, I have to get up and take them because I have a doctor's appointment at night. And I'm not trying to cause problems more between them. I just want to know if she's okay. And Chris told you that he was on his way... Yes, I just talked to him. Well, I talked to him here. One of our other friends did via text because I was going to the doctor's office, and she said he would be here in about 30 minutes, and that was at 108. And then I called in and said, Chris, I'm at your house. I'm not trying to cause drama or anything. I just need to know your wife, okay? I was like, where are you? And he was like, I'm on I-70. I'm about a half hour to 45 minutes out. And I just said, okay, and then I hung up and called you guys because that, I mean, I'm just worried. So... Nicole's a really good friend, but you can hear how concerned she is and also how unconcerned Chris seems to be on hearing that his wife and daughters are missing. He just said she was on a play date with the girls and didn't seem to care that Shanann's car was still there. Police showed up at the house at 1.40 p.m. to do a welfare check, and the whole thing is actually on body cam video. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned earlier, this is something that makes this case extremely intriguing because you can see the entire investigation unfold in this video and you can see the body language of Chris and the neighbors and Nicole and her son. It's very interesting. An officer named Scott Coonrod, his last name's actually Coonrod. Mm hmm. Interesting. Spelled like raccoon rod. Yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> An officer named Scott Coonrod arrived and got the same synopsis we just heard in the 911 call from Nicole. He made his way to the front door and looked inside, knocking and asking for anyone present to make themselves known. There was no response. Nicole told him that she knew the passcode to open the front door, but that it was locked by a latch on the inside. Officer Coonrod asked if she knew the garage door code, which she didn't. So he suggested that she call Chris and asked to get the garage code and permission to enter. So, this sounds reasonable. If Chris was concerned about the welfare of his wife and daughters, but too far out to get there quickly, of course he'd want to give people who are already there permission to go in and help. Mm -hmm. You know, give them the garage code, let right. them in the house. Nicole, at this point, was concerned that Shanann had passed out or something, because, again, she was diabetic. She had been in that car accident a while ago. And she hadn't been feeling well all weekend, had barely eaten or drank anything. And, you know, that has a huge effect on your blood sugar if you change up your diet patterns, um, especially when you're diabetic. So if she was in a diabetic coma or something, she'd be incapacitated. And that's what Nicole and Doc, uh, Officer Coonrod were worried about. While the officer waited to hear back, he started walking around the house from window to window jumping down into window wells and knocking, and even knocking on the porch door. 
The next door neighbors saw the commotion and came out onto their back porch to see if everything was okay. And this neighbor's name was Nate. Officer Coonrod asked if he'd seen his neighbors today, but he didn't have any useful information. He wasn't able to spot anyone through the window or find any probable cause to enter. He said that since he didn't have consent from a homeowner and didn't see anyone in the house in distress, that he couldn't legally force entry, even though Nicole's son was kind of egging him on, didn't wanting him to break in, you know. But he had to follow the rules. So Nicole at this time was trying to call Chris for the garage code, but he wasn't answering her. So she called Shanann's mom, Sandra, to get the code. But uh, Officer Coonrod said even if they had the code, he couldn't legally enter without the permission of the property owner. But Sandra said something interesting on the phone that caused even more confusion in the case. Sandra said that when she talked to Chris, asking why Shanann wasn't responding, he told her that Shanann was away from home at a girlfriend's house. So, hmm. there's two different stories, which is odd. After this, Officer Coonrod asked for Chris's phone number because he felt like they were wasting time. He called and asked if he had any idea where his wife is, expressing his concern that she could be hurt inside. But Chris told him that he was just five minutes out, and Officer Coonrod ended the call. I do wonder why he didn't ask Chris for the garage code during this call or ask for permission to enter. But he's a professional here. Mm -hmm. Nicole's son, Nick, started telling Officer Coonrod how he knew Chris was lying because he had told them that he was 45 minutes out twice in a row and had told two different stories to Nicole and Sandra. After this, Officer Coonrod asked Nicole for Shanann's phone number and he tried calling her to see if he could hear a phone ringing in the house. That was a good idea. Mm -hmm. But again... You know, he was worried she was unconscious somewhere in the house with complications from diabetes, and he was looking for some type of probable cause to enter the home. Mm -hmm. But it didn't ring at all. It just went straight to voicemail. After this, Nick let Officer Coonrod know that the next-door neighbor who had been on his back porch earlier had a security camera that may have captured something. Officer Coonrod again knocked on the door, screaming for anyone inside to make themselves known. So at this point, Shanann's car is in the garage. She's not answering Nicole. The suspicion is that she's inside with her two daughters and obviously incapacitated. But, I mean, the cops banging on the door and yelling. I don't know how Bella and Cece would react to this because it's a stranger yelling outside the house. So, you know, who knows if they would come to the door or not. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. After more unsuccessful attempts to get someone to come to the door, Officer Coonrod told Nick that if someone was there, you'd probably hear something from the inside. Can't argue with that. Finally, less than a minute later, Chris got to the house. It had been over 17 minutes since Officer Coonrod had arrived at the home. So, almost two hours after he'd told Nicole he'd be home in 30 minutes... But something very interesting about this initial interaction that we see with Chris is the way he acts when he gets home. Mm -hmm. You would think that he'd jump out of the car, frantically run up and let everyone into the house, trying to search for his wife and daughters and make sure they're okay. But Chris just casually got out of his truck, jogged around the front to the passenger door, opened it, got something out of it. I mean, if he's getting the garage door opener, why couldn't he have just grabbed it from the driver's seat, you know? And then, as if he hadn't wasted enough time, he jogged up the driveway and went in for a handshake to Officer Coonrod and introduced himself. It's like, what's the point of that? Possibly trying to suck up to the cop and act like a buddy? And then, instead of running into the house to check for Shanann... Chris, seemingly unconcerned, opens the garage door, walks inside, and then opens the passenger door of Shanann's car, mm -hmm. seeming to look around inside and grab something off the floor of the passenger seat. So it's Very odd. Very odd behavior. Yeah, and it's so many different things in a row that you're like, why are you wasting time? Mm -hmm. Go inside and see if your wife's okay. Chris seemed to look around inside the garage for a bit longer after that. While the next-door neighbor showed up, 
and told Officer Coonrod that the last action on his camera was a white car pulling up and that there had been nothing else that day. The white car was Nicole when she had arrived to check on Shanann. Nicole walked into the garage and looked inside the car, noticing that the girls' car seats were still inside the car. So she surmised that Shanann must have left with a friend that had a car with car seats, or else she would have taken them. Chris had made his way into the house by that point, leaving Officer Coonrod standing outside of the driveway with Nicole, Nick, and the next-door neighbor. Nate. He still hadn't given Officer Coonrod consent to search the home. Officer Coonrod asked the neighbor if he could go check for more footage, going back earlier than he had before. Then Nicole, Nick, and Officer Coonrod walked around to the front door waiting. Nicole asked if they could go into the house, and Officer Coonrod, Coonrod let her know that it was up to Chris, because it was his house. After being inside the house by himself for over a minute, Chris finally opened the door to let the others in. It's interesting that he was in there for a whole minute by himself. Mm-hmm, definitely. But so you, when you walk inside... The family room's to the right, and then there are stairs to the left, which go up to kind of a loft area between all the bedrooms and bathroom and stuff. So Chris walked past all of that into the back of the house, where there's a kitchen and a living room, and uh, he was just standing in the kitchen, looking down at his phone, mm-hmm. acting rather casual for the situation he was in. Officer Coonrod asked if he checked upstairs and if he was okay with him searching up there, adding that he just wants to make sure she isn't passed out somewhere, and then asked for permission to look around. So he really covered his bases there, you know, like making sure he had permission to search so Chris couldn't, you know, say later on that this wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. Officer Coonrod went through each room he found, searching him with a flashlight. He wasn't able to find anything. Eventually, Chris came out of a room with Shanann's phone, which was turned off. Nicole was shocked to find out that she had left the house without her phone. Also, who turns off their phone at home? Unless they're rebooting it or something. Nobody. Exactly. So this is when Nicole is starting to realize that this could be a lot more serious than she thought. And I think it's interesting. Um, I talk about Derek Van Shake a lot. My favorite YouTube body language expert. Um, But when he broke this down, he noticed that after Chris set down Shanann's phone on the banister ledge, Nicole reached for it. But when she touched it, she pulled her hand back like it burned her, Mm -hmm. you know, like he was, she was touching something hot. And his assessment was that she had that reaction because this was the first piece of evidence that meant something horrible could have happened to her friend. And it, felt like a burn when she touched it because of the implications in the bigger picture here. You know, her friend was possibly in danger. And after this, Nicole started to visibly panic. Chris said that her phone was her lifeline, implying that she never would have left without it. Then he continued to stare at the phone, sitting on the banister, rocking back and forth, looking more angry than concerned. Nicole and Nick started to distance themselves from Chris, because they were getting strange vibes from him and starting to suspect that he may know more than he's letting on. So that had to be terrifying. But to be fair, you know, everyone responds to these situations in their own way. Maybe Chris was in so much shock that he didn't know what to do. I mean, he was staring at Shanann's phone, waiting for it to boot up while checking his own phone every few seconds, Mm -hmm. just like a nervous tick looking at his phone. Then he asked Nicole if she knew the passcode. Nicole says she didn't, and Chris said the only one he knew was five five digits, and now it's six. Nicole suggested he try the baby's due date, which seemed to have worked, because then Chris started scrolling through the phone without picking it up. Officer Coonrod asked about Shanann's diabetes, and Chris and Nicole both said she hadn't gone into into a diabetic shock for several years but that she was having bad migraines. Nicole said that while they were on their weekend trip, Shanann had barely been eating because of the migraines. Her friend Cassie in Arizona, who was a nurse, had said that during the weekend that Shanann's blood sugar was really low, 
which was causing her to get the migraines, which was causing her to continue to not eat. And I would imagine it was also the stress of not of knowing the man that you've invested your entire life in and started a family with wants to leave you. You know? Mm-hmm. That's a huge bombshell. But apparently this was the first time in several years that her blood sugar had been unregulated. Then Chris said that she takes Imitrex for migraines and that she'd taken more in the past month than usual because she spent six weeks in North Carolina and her migraines were worse there with the heat and the humidity. So, side note, Imitrex is a drug for migraine headaches. But what's interesting here is that when Chris was telling the officer about this trip to North Carolina, the way he phrased it was that they were both in North Carolina together Hmm. with the kids. But we know now that she was there without him. So, that's interesting. Just another, you know, he was not telling the whole truth situation but during this whole thing chris continued to look at his phone and then nicole started looking at shanann's phone which made chris suddenly jump in and tell her that he already checked her phone and there were no quote-unquote off text messages so like you know kind of dismissive of the whole searching the phone thing and then nicole asked chris if he could go look at his home camera security system to see when she left. Because apparently they had a video doorbell. But Chris's reaction to this is also very strange. I mean, you'd think that someone would be like, duh, of course we should check that. Check anything we possibly can to see what happened to my daughters and my wife. But he just looked at her kind of irritated and shaking his head for a second before spitting out some unintelligible words that sounded like, Well, uh, unless she walked out the front door, that won't do anything. That won't help. You know, I'm not sure what he said, but his demeanor here is just so dismissive. Like, wouldn't you want to try anything you possibly could to figure out what happened? Mm Mm-hmm. Nicole went on to say to Chris, you told me that she went on a play date with the girls. And while she was talking to him, she was actually backing away, subtly showing that she was afraid of him and the truth remember she and nick had already realized that his story didn't add up after nicole had said that about the play date chris said that's what she told me then nicole went on to say that he had told shanann's mother that she was at a friend's house chris could sense that she was trying to poke holes in his story and quickly interjected to weave it all together he said she left to go to a friend's house with the kids That's why they weren't at school. Nicole pointed out that Sandra had said that Chris told her Shanann left in the middle of the night. Again, Chris corrected her and said, oh, no, she didn't leave in the middle of the night, no. And while he said that, he was shaking his head and biting his lip. And then he looked back down at his phone and was clearly texting someone and then, like, swiping through his phone. It's just... Why is he so focused on his phone? That's not where the answers are going to be. Especially if Shanann's phone is at the house turned off. It's not like Shanann's going to be texting you. Mm -hmm. So get off your phone and look for your wife. But even when the policeman started to ask him more questions about where the kids go to school, Chris wouldn't look up from his phone. He was so buried in his phone. Things continued in circles. But then there was a bombshell realization They learned from the neighbor that the only vehicles to leave the house that day were Chris and Nicole. There was no sign of Shanann leaving. So, Shanann never left the house, at least not in a car via the driveway. But to this news, although Nicole was visibly shocked and terrified, Chris just casually said, Okay, Like, there's no worry or change in demeanor in learning that his wife never left the house in a car the way that he says she told him she did. But this is when Officer Coonrod really seems to have become suspicious of Chris. Chris didn't seem to have any desire to find his wife, although he did come across as nervous. But again, I need to bring up Derek Derek Van Shake here. Because he noticed that while both Nicole and Chris were visibly nervous and pacing back and forth, Nicole's 
nervousness was directed outward, searching for answers, looking anywhere she could to find answers and making calls to see if anyone knew anything. But Chris's nervous energy was actually directed more inward. He was avoiding eye contact, just buried in his phone and making no effort to search Mm -hmm. or come up with any ideas. Chris continued to fiddle around with his phone while Officer Coonrod asked him questions about his work schedule. Chris insisted that Shanann was home when he left for work that morning. But then Nicole asked if he thought that they could be at the pool. And hey, that would actually make sense. They had a pool within walking distance. Maybe she took the girls out through the back and they never walked within view of the camera on the way to the pool, you know? Mm-hmm. It would also explain why she left her phone at home, since you don't usually take your phone to the pool. So this idea gave Nicole more hope that things might still be okay. And you'd think it would do the same for Chris. Chris replied, at the pool, in doubt, barely glancing up from his phone. Then he casually and reluctantly said, I can run down there and check. But then he just moved from one side of the stairs to leaning on a banister on the other side of the stairs, continuing to look at his phone. I mean, he's not showing any sign that he wants to find his family. The pool was literally the last hope of finding out that they were okay, you know? But instead of rushing down the stairs and over to the pool to check, he just casually walks to the other side of the stairs and leans on the banister, continuing to stare at his phone. (laughs) So that's when Officer Coonrod asked Chris if they were going through any kind of marital issues, to which Chris reveals to him that they were going through a separation. Officer Coonrod asked if they had filed yet, and Chris said they wanted to sell the house first before separating. So Coonrod asked if it was remaining civil, and Chris said it was. Then Coonrod asked if she goes to the pool often, and Chris said, It just depends. I mean, like, on a hot day like this, I wouldn't know. Like, what does that even mean? Hot days are when you go to the pool. Like, why aren't you running to the pool to check for your family? He just keeps looking at his phone, texting and scrolling. And I think Officer Coonrod here was trying to, like, hint back at that, like, why aren't you going to check at the pool right now? Like, he gave Chris the answer. Go do this, and you might look like a normal human being. Mm. But instead, he just ignored it again. After a bit, Chris randomly decided to walk into the bedroom, after not searching anywhere else at all while they were upstairs. A little bit later, he walked out of the room with his pointer finger extended, showing Nicole what he had found. It was Shanann's wedding band. So that's interesting. And this is when the officer starts to ask a lot of questions about Shanann and her work, asking if she'd left a note by the ring or anything that could give us a clue where she was. But again, Chris doesn't give them anything useful, and it seems like he's using this discovery as another reason to be cold and distant Mm -hmm. and put no effort into this. Even though, who cares if they're having marital issues, there's still two daughters missing. Right. Eventually, they all went to the neighbor's house to double-check the footage to see what they could find. As Officer Coonrod walked into the house, the neighbor was looking at the TV, getting the video ready, and Chris was standing right in front of the TV with his back to it, still looking at his phone and rocking back and forth. Why isn't he curious what they could find on the camera footage? I get that he's emotionally checked out of his marriage, but again... He still has two daughters that are missing. Why wouldn't he be intently watching that footage for any clues the neighbor may have missed earlier? Could he seem more suspicious? As the officer walked in, Chris was standing with his back to the TV, listing off all the things he had to load in his truck that morning in preparation for the work he needed to do that day. He said he loaded his water jugs, his book bag, his computers, and some tools he'd need. So that seems really random, but it will come into play later. Again, at this point, Chris is buried in whatever he's doing on his phone, holding it very close to his body. The neighbor, Nate, showed Officer Coonrod a recording from 5.17 that morning of Chris backing his pickup truck into his garage. 
Finally, Chris put away his phone and explained that he backed into the garage so he wouldn't need to lug all of his tools all the way up the driveway. So, why does he feel the need to explain in such detail what he was doing here? You know? Mm -hmm. First, he listed all that stuff that he needed to load before the officer even watched the video. And now when the video is playing, he's continuing to explain away these actions like they're just normal. After saying this, he turned away from the TV and looked at Nate's door, taking a deep breath. It almost looked like he wanted to run for it. And at this point, he's starting to realize that all of the suspicion is falling on him. The one morning he happened to back into the garage is also the day his wife goes missing without any footage of her leaving. He himself confirmed that she was there when he left for work that day. So he knows he's looking really bad. After this, Chris puts his hands on the top of his head and started swaying back and forth. He was trying to act relaxed when obviously he was really nervous. The officer and Nate were both completely silent. And they were both starting to realize that there's more that Chris wasn't telling them. I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point that Chris is hiding something. And can you imagine being in a room with your neighbor as you help the police discover that he's likely guilty of some kind of foul play? That would be a weird feeling. Chris randomly starts talking about how he had issues in recent weeks with people stealing stuff out of the garages in the neighborhood, and that's why he started parking on the street. But what does that have to do with anything? Like, why isn't he more interested in finding his wife? All he's actually doing is trying to divert suspicion now between explaining why he backed into the garage to saying there were thieves in the neighborhood to finding the wedding band implying that Shannon just randomly left him and then saying she was at a friend's house or on a play date to two separate people. He was also constantly talking about how his garage door sensor was faulty because of um, on his phone it was telling him that it was shut when it was actually open. This is according to Chris. But he's putting nowhere near the same effort into actually finding them, you know? Mm -hmm. And then to top it all off, Chris tries to say that the neighbor's camera might have just not been triggered when Shanann left since it was a motion detection camera. But Nate had plenty of footage proving that the camera was triggered by any motion at all, no matter how small in the area Shanann would have been when she left. After all this, Chris suddenly looks to the officer and tells him, she's pregnant as well. It seems like he was putting in a last-ditch effort to try to come across as genuinely concerned, even though he's done nothing to try to help find her. Then, again, he brings up the faulty garage door sensor. But again, that has nothing to do with finding Shanann. And I want to explain why the garage was the only way that she could have left. Remember, the chain was on the front door. And you can only do that from the inside, not when you're leaving. So she couldn't have gone out that way. And also the porch door was locked from the inside. So hmm. the garage was the only way she could have gone out. So they finish looking at the footage, and they all start to walk back outside. But Officer Coonrod hangs back, and as Chris is going out the door, he notices and looks back at them. And when Chris looked back, it was like deer in the headlights. Coonrod told Chris to wait outside so he could get Nate's info really quick. As soon as Chris was gone, Nate says to Coonrod, he's not acting right at all. Shaking his head in disgust, pointing out how he was rocking back and forth and acting so uninterested in the footage. Nate went on to say, he never loads his stuff in and out of the garage ever. He said Chris usually just walks back and forth, carrying his stuff out to his truck of which he has plenty of recorded evidence. Yeah, like, Nate can literally back up all the things he's saying with his video footage. So, you know, just like when we talked about Carol Baskin, when someone exhibits odd behavior on the same day something odd happens, they probably had something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Nate continued to evaluate the video pointing out that Chris walked back and forth between the driver door of his truck and the garage several times. 
He also talked about how he's heard Chris and Shanann fighting and full out screaming at each other ever since she got home from North Carolina. He talked about how Chris is usually really quiet and subdued, but how today he kept going on and on about what he was loading in his truck. So it's pretty obvious that Nate is extremely suspicious of Chris. But Officer Coonrod actually tells Nate to put himself in Chris's position and imagine how nervous he would be. Now, at first, it seems like he's defending Chris, but Mm. in reality, he probably just doesn't want anyone in the neighborhood to know that the police are on to Chris and suspicious of him, just to make sure it doesn't get back to him and cause him to shut up or get a lawyer or even run away before they can take action. Mm -hmm. It's actually a really smart move on his part. Mm -hmm. So the next day, Chris appeared on a couple Denver news media outlets talking about his missing wife. He told them, I have no inclination of where they're at right now, and I just want everybody back here and everybody safe. But these interviews won't end up leaning in his favor. And that's where we'll pick back up next week. In part two, we're going to talk about his news interviews and also when police questioned him. I mean, we've only scratched the surface here, and I'm hoping to get this done in two parts, but There's just so much information available about this case, and it's all fascinating Mm -hmm. and also heart-wrenching. So stay tuned for part two. If you're not subscribed, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it. Um, And we appreciate you listening. Do we have any cat news this week? Mm, Not so much. They're doing very well. Well, did we talk about that fish that I bought them? I think we did. I don't remember. Oh, well... In case we didn't, I um, was feeling like a bad cat, feeling like a bad cat parent, because who knows? I feel like I'm actually a really good cat parent, but <laughs> I splurged and I one bought of those them. Days. Yeah, it was one of those days. I bought them a fish that is battery operated, and when you touch it, it its tail moves, so it's like flopping like a fish out of water. But I, it really is loud. Yeah. Keep talking about it. I'm going to go get it so they can hear it. Oh, cool. Okay, well, it's orange. I got it to match queso so he doesn't feel left out because he's the only orange cat that we have. And, oh, here, you hear that? Yep, that's what the fish sounds like. Are there more than one setting on this? No. I feel like... Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, (laughs) that's the fish. How does it shut off? Sometimes we wake up late at night. Oh, okay. Sorry, I tried to throw it out the door, but I missed. We wake up late at night to the noise of that stupid fish going off. Yep. Cats love it. Actually, it's just all night. (laughs) I'm surprised the battery still works. It's chargeable. It's not battery operated. I'm sorry. It's charged. Have you charged it yet? Yeah, several times. Oh, (laughs) can't you switch it off before we go to bed? I could. But then I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. So anyways, that's the only cat news I can think of right now. They're good. The boys are good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are slowly getting fully settled into our new place. Still far from settled in. But Oh, just a, just this room, really. Yeah, and we're just waiting for stuff to arrive. Mm-hmm. You know, because um, obviously we're in the middle of a crazy time right now, so shipping is very slow, which we completely understand. But it's a weird time to move. You know, mm-hmm. no help moving. No. <laughs> but it, it all worked out. It's all good. Yeah, it, it's been fun. Mm-hmm. And we've really appreciated all the love that we've gotten from people on Instagram and email and stuff. Mm-hmm. You guys are awesome. That's pretty much all we got this week. If mm-hmm. you are new here, don't forget to subscribe or follow us on Instagram at VOV Podcast. Um, yeah. If you uh, want to email <laughs> us, it's at <laughs> VOV Podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And we are also on Facebook mm-hmm. at Voice of the Victim Support System. And yeah, I think that's about it. Sorry that I can't talk very well (laughs) even though you listen to me talk for an hour every week Um, so anyway (laughs) I think that sums it up 
Yep, that's Leave us a five-star review to hear your review being read off by us. Uh-huh. All right. All right. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.